gender and sexuality become this way to police the borders of Palestinian identity in particular, which I find very problematic. I myself have experienced rejection from larger family, from community organizations. I've been invited to give keynote addresses and uninvited because people have asked, oh, you know, please don't talk about queerness, right? As I'm not going to not talk about queerness. I am a queer person, right? The policing of the borders of Palestinianness. That policing is is taking place taking place within the realm of gender and sexuality. Ramaya Cable is an assistant professor of American culture and film, TV, and media at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. They have a BA in American Studies from Smith College and a PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity from the University of Southern California. They also have a graduate certificate in Visual Studies from the USC Visual Studies Research Institute. Their research and teaching interests span the fields of race and ethnic studies, film and media studies, anti-colonial studies, and queer theory, with a particular focus on the roles that art, film, and media play in the mobilization of Palestine solidarity politics in the United States. Their research has been through, supported through fellowships at Northwestern University and Harvard University. Welcome, Maria, to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I wanted to start with a general question. Um, I know that in your Twitter bio, you mentioned that uh, you started out in art school and then kind of left art school. And I wanted to ask, like, what drew you to art school? What were you interested in studying at the time? And what made you decide, like, this is it for me, I should be? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's an it's an odd place to kind of start, but um, it's actually something that I bring up a lot with my students um, as a reason to take time off after college. Um, I started a master's of fine art program at San Francisco Art Institute in 2006 in photography, and I had graduated in 2005 from Smith. um, And I had been practicing photography for years all throughout high school and in college and taking advanced classes. And I thought I really wanted to become a working artist. Um, And I found out very quickly that the kind of program that I was in was not necessarily going to help with the what I understood to be the business aspects of art, which I also found kind of gross. Um, And that a lot of kind of making it in the art world relied on, you know, the typical things like nepotism. Um, but what I found really dis- discouraging was that um, there was very little interest in talking about things that might be considered quote unquote political, uh, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, um, certainly not Palestine. Um, and so I just didn't feel like I had a place, um, you know, think doing the things that I wanted to do. I felt that my work was not received very well. And I thought this is just too much money to spend two years Um and not sure kind of what I would get out of it. Um, So I decided to wing it (laughs) after that. I got a job as a custom printmaker in a um, kind of high-end family portrait studio in San Francisco. I ran their dark room and their digital lab. um, And I had access to the whole studio and and lab and and dark room. And I just kind of did whatever I wanted. And that included going to Palestine and making a photo essay. that included like various portrait projects, including um, like what I was calling at the time the Queer Swana Portrait Project, um, Swana being short for Southwest Asian North African. Um, and then the economy collapsed. And so I decided to go back to school. And that was, uh, that was after five years of, you know, really being a starving artist and doing lots of different freelance things. Um, and that's how I ended up in a doctoral program at University of Southern California. Um, does your experience in art school or in photography influence your analysis of films or your perspective in like academic research or do you feel like they're kind of like two separate entities that don't cross as much as you'd expect? Yeah, I mean, I'm very much a visual learner and a visually oriented person. I I visualize things in my head all the time. Um, I don't necessarily narrativize them. Um, so mm-hmm. when I'm planning things out, it's very it's very visual in my mind, my mind's eye. Um, you know, I was always just a, a very kind of creatively inc- inclined kid, um, and in in high school, and I. I really fell in love with especially foreign cinema in my teens. And so I I had a great um, access to a great collection of independent and uh, foreign films through 
a video rental store called Hollywood Express in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where I grew up. And I rented so many films and I just was curious and I loved learning through watching films and seeing how people conveyed stories, how people conveyed messages, whether they were overtly political, whether they were not. Um, And so that really just kind of spoke to me throughout my youth. And then, and I really enjoyed making visual material um, and expressing myself visually. Um, Of course, when you go into academia, you have to do that in writing. And um, so I have really, you know, shifted gears dramatically to predominantly be expressing myself both in academic ways and in personal ways in writing. But I have always maintained a creative impulse. And um, actually for my second project, after I finish the book, the first book, uh, my second project is going to be a documentary film. So I'm hopefully going to be merging my two loves of um, art and creative expression and writing and academia. Okay, I have like three different follow-up questions, but I'm going to chase it back a little bit. Um, can you talk a bit about the Queer Swana Portrait Project and like what drew you to um, creating that project? If it's still alive, if it's like holds a special place in your heart, either personally or professionally, like what? Um, how did you kind of like conceive of it and kind of like nurture it um, through the time that you were working on it? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's not really alive. I mean, it's not dead, <laughs> but it's, it's dormant. Um, yeah. It's been in hibernation. Um, you know, I started doing that on my own at a time when, you know, film, like traditional gelatin silver film um, was in the decline and digital was on the rise. And it was the first time I really used digital photography. And I really did not like it. I did not like digital photography <laughs> Um, but I recognized that financially it was, you know, as someone who didn't have a lot of resources, digital was going to be more cost effective. Um, I was also at the time connecting with various other, um, specifically queer Arab American people, queer and trans Arab American people. Um, and then broader, a more like broader queer and trans Swana community, um, through the internet, uh, this magical thing, um, <laughs> And that's how I made some of my now nearest and dearest, closest friends, some of whom are in academia, some of whom are not. Um, But I essentially, um, you know, made friends with these folks through uh, email listservs and on the Internet. And um, at various times I traveled to go photograph them. So that's how I met um, some of my my closest friends, like my current colleague, Charlotte Karen Albrecht. Um, a community of folks in Minneapolis. Um, and uh, I photographed a lot in the Bay Area. Whenever people would come to town to visit, um, I would photograph them. Uh, the show, I did have some work in a show in at the Stockholm Sweden Pride Festival. And I did show a little bit in a gallery in San Francisco. But, um, you know, when the economy tanked in 08, 09, everything kind of went off the rails and I had to kind of reevaluate mm-hmm. my life. So um, that's kind of yeah. how that came to a close. And I also was very, um, I, I admittedly did not have great experiences with some members of the Swana community in the Bay Area. Um, particularly, there was like a lot of um, kind of what I feel to be extraction of artists' labor um, for things mm-hmm. to do things promotional things for like parties and yeah. and dance nights and clubs and um I was going set to do um a photo shoot at a dance club a queer swana dance club evening and I had just a very bad experience with the organizers of that event who I felt were, were really extractive in their their labor um trying to yeah. extract my labor so that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth and I also realized yeah. that when you love something like making art and you try to make it into a business or you try to make a living off of it, it really can be not fun. It can be really awful um, because then you have to mix the thing that you love and that you feel so pure about and and the thing that like sometimes is really awful, like money and capitalism. And it just really, I really did not like that aspect of it. So I kind of really stepped back. Yeah, no, that that makes sense because I'm I think that's something that a lot of people grapple with when it comes to like the arts, which is like, do you professionalize it or do you keep it for yourself? Because it's something that's already so intimate and um, 
personal and emotive in nature. And that's hard to kind of manage that. Yeah. Um, Professionalization and the the capitalization. Oh, God. Yeah. (laughs) Always great. So good. (laughs) Um, I'm going to back us up a little bit, too. Um, What drew you to film? Was that something that like, and what made you decide I'm going to study like film or make film? Was that something that kind of happened in like your PhD process? I know that you talked about it a little bit with regards to like international cinema and like watching that um, as you were growing up or um, what made you decide that like, I'm going to start working in about working on this in a professional capacity? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting, interesting question because, um, it really has to do kind of with timing. Um, when I was co- like cultivating my um, dissertation prospectus, I was actually going to do a project on art, on, on Palestinian art. And my advisor, Sarah Goltieri at the University of Southern California, read my initial draft and she said, I don't know why you're pitching this project on art when all you ever talk about is films and film festivals. And she wasn't wrong. Um I was really, this was around um, 2012, 13. And at that time, um, Palestine film festivals were really start to, starting to rise up um, on the rise. Um, a lot of them were founded in like 06, 07, um, but they really started to gain a lot of traction after 2010. Um, and this had a little bit mm-hmm. to do with like geopolitics at the time, um, you know, 2000. 10 to 2012, like lots of, and 2014 onslaughts on Gaza really um, drew people's attention. And so film festivals started to become this place where Palestine could be talked about and talked and represented um, in ways that were considered cultural um, and not necessarily political, right? Um, And so film festivals became a kind of safer place to represent and talk about Palestine and, and Palestinian cultural politics in ways that um, previously were really difficult. And and so um, right. I was really interested in how these festivals started to, you know, capitalize is not the right word, but capitalize on the moment and 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 use kind of the realm of culture to, to uh, represent Palestine and talk about Palestine, um, despite, you know, other attempts to um, kind of silence discussions of Palestine. So that's how and why I ended up writing my dissertation on Palestine themed film festivals. And that's kind of how, where the book originates. Um, my book project originates. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that, that people are always kind of asking me when they read my work is like, well, where's the textual analysis? And I do do some textual analysis and then people are always asking me to, to do more of it. But my interest in Palestinian film is less in, looking at film as an aesthetic text and doing kind of traditional film analysis and textual analysis and looking at film within a much larger kind of context and political economy. So thinking about um, the social aspects of, of cinema and cinema culture and, you know, exhibition, um, the circulation of those films, audiences, uh, the way these films are received, the way that they're talked about, um, so that's kind of more where the project is is situated, is looking at film as a kind of mobilizing agent um, and cinema culture mm. as a mobilizing agent as opposed to just a text. Um, that I think actually ties really nicely into this other conversation that we were having before, which is like, um, what drew you to media activism and how do you see it as something that's like unique or different than other types of activism? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at, at core, my book project is focused on Palestinian cinema as a form of media activism. Um, you know, social movements have always relied on media to communicate their goals and their demands. Um, and media activism has gotten a lot more attention and, and students want to study it more, especially in the context of things like the Internet and social media. But in my teaching and, and in my, my research, I really stress that media activism predates the internet <laughs> and predates things like social media and Twitter. Um, and so just to kind of give you an example, when I was teaching during like the hard lockdown of pandemic, um, I started at University of Michigan in 2020. 
Um, and I taught my media activism class first online in 2020 and then in person in 2021. The parts of my media activism class or the segment of my media activism class that really, I think, changed my students' kind of perspective was when we talked about AIDS activism and the AIDS activist movement and the in the 1990s and the uses of media there. And I think you know, with the pandemic raging and um, the trauma that people were enduring, they really did not know much about AIDS activism and, you know, AIDS history in general. And so they were really at first shocked to hear all this when they were learning about, you know, the AIDS crisis in the 90s. And they didn't realize the extent of it. And then also were able to really attach to and understand the uses of media in the context of that crisis because it really reflected the other crises that they were living through at the time um yeah. if that makes sense that that does can you can you touch a, a little bit on like what kind of media activism was happening in the 90s around the AIDS crisis yeah so i i talked to them a lot about things like culture jamming and looking at um you know act up um, ACT UP was an activist, one of the kind of most widely um, represented and, and recognized activist groups in the 90s around AIDS activism. Um, and ACT UP used things like culture jamming, which is a way with the, of um, essentially taking um, kind of common sense understandings of like graphic design and visual culture and flipping it and, and kind of subverting the message. So um there were, you know, lots of different kind of design elements to act up, act, act up, act up. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like stuttering all my words. Uh, act up used design in, in I think, create really creative ways. So things like, um, you know, uh, making posters and flyers, you know, little things that like are, would be considered in archivist terms as ephemera. Um or even things like um, ads on the sides of buses. So thinking about the kind of visual culture that ACT UP used to, to project their message and communicate their message. So I had my students watch um, Jim Hubbard's film, United in Anger, which is um, based on the video archive that was produced alongside ACT UP, documenting ACT UP's um, work. And the documentary film was released, I believe, in 2012, looking back on ACT UP okay. and AIDS activism. Um, so and it's a great it's a great documentary film. It, you know, it's it has some some issues, of course, as all documentary films have. Um, I like to prom problematize every form of representation, but um, students really gravitated towards that. Um, and then in comparison, I had them watch the uh, Oscar nominated film um, How to Survive a Plague. Um, because that's a very different representation of AIDS activism in the 90s. Um, and so they could see these kind of two comparisons and see, you know, how the like really mainstream popular, the way that like, um, you know, more mainstream audiences see AIDS activism in hindsight through film, which would be um, the film How to Survive a Plague versus Jim Hubbard's alternative representation of that history. Um. I think when you kind of like look at these different movements, um, they kind of like have these similarities with regards to like mobilizing through media. I know like um, the, there, there's some really interesting discussion about like PLO and like Beirut using some similar kind of like uh, ephemera or media. Um, but I'm interested to hear what strikes you between the different social movements you examine and their activism strategies. Do you find that they tend to have very similar kind of like ways of using media or do they tend to have like very different ways of thinking about it or like what kind of what where are you kind of like seeing these like um threads intertwine yeah i mean there's no one way to do media activism you know um you, you could look at like early abolitionist work and look at like the use of ethnic press ethnic media like ethnic newspapers um, to circulate um, information about, you know, abolition. I'm talking about slavery abolition, right? Um, or you, and that's like 18th, 19th century, the use of press, news press, news media. Um, you could look at, um, you know, the use of video and in the AIDS crisis, um, 
as a form of documentation and also as a form of artistic ex expression. You could look at culture jamming and the magazine ad busters and how um, artists and graphic designers will take kind of glossy mainstream corporate advertising and take that aesthetic and use it to convey a subversive message, right? That's kind of what the whole premise of the, the magazine ad busters was, is. Um, or you could look at things like what is uh, often referred to as tactical media, um, where it's kind of more fleeting. The kinds of media activism that you might consider tactical media would be um, another example from my class is um, I introduced my students to uh, the Illuminator Artist Collective, which will project images onto um, buildings, the sides of buildings. So they uh, very famously um, project things onto the Supreme Court. <laughs> um, Whatever is happening at the time, they will put these huge projections onto the Supreme Court or they will project things onto the sides of like um, academic buildings. Or at one point, I think they projected onto the Guggenheim. And that could, they could either be text, textual words or, um, or, you know, images, but it, again, it's a fleeting kind of more performative form of, it's a performance of activism, right? Through light, through this like visual, like light projection onto a, a larger building. Um, other forms of tactical media would be like the use of the internet or like, um, hacktivism, um, or the way that you can kind of like, uh, use coding and use the internet to kind of subvert but again it's like more fleeting and it's less about controlling how people use that code and kind of seeing how the code gets taken up right so um, media activism comes in many many different flavors and forms it's not just hashtag activism on twitter um it can be many different things right right um i think we kind of started touching on it, so I'll, I'll bring us back um, to it about like Palestinian film festivals being like the space where like you can uh, engage in war through um, media activism around Palestine as a kind of like as a, a third space where like the cultural sector is the way that you can have these conversations. Um, I know your book project kind of touches on it. Um, I know we were starting to talk about it, so I'm going to kind of like hear us in the question of like, what is so interesting and unique about film festivals in particular? Um, how do they kind of like mobilize people? Um, and then what does it mean to have like a particular um, cinematic culture that is somehow rooted in this kind of like activist um, philosophy or orientation? Yeah, um, great question. So um, the thing that's interesting about film festivals, to me at least, is that they're very social, um, you know, we like to think, I mean, we have been living through pandemic times where people have been largely isolated from one another. But, um, and I can talk about how film festivals survived through those lockdown times yeah. in another way, but another time. But um, for film festivals, they are kind of a continuation of like the Hafla tradition, like the Arab um, festival tradition, um, these like, kind of large gatherings with music and dance. Um, and food and festivities, right? Um, which I attended as a child, like in the 80s and 90s in, in the Arab American community that I grew up in, in the Boston area. Um, so I really see film festivals as kind of a continuation of that kind of diasporic tradition. But, you know, outside of the Arab American communities, film festivals are are these kind of social events that that people will go to, you know, the opening screening and there will often be a reception afterwards. There will be a Q&A. Sometimes the director will be there. They're not just kind of sitting in a dark room and consuming a piece of media. They're um, a group activity and, you know, you're, you're milling about with people before and after the screening. Um, you're interacting with with guest speakers in a Q&A. You're kind of catching up with old friends at, with drinks at the, the reception after the opening screening. Um, so I was interested in how these festivals, this like larger space of the festival as, as a place where the discourse on Palestine was taking place um, among spectators, amongst, um, you know, festival organizers and volunteers, or sometimes uh, among protesters, right? Um, uh, which unfortunately happens. Um, or uh, the way that um, protesting around Palestine solidarity um, also happens at other festivals. So like famously thinking about like the way that 
um, folks, Palestine solidarity activists protested outside of things like Fra- the Frameline Film Festival in San Francisco. Frameline is the kind of most um, renowned LGBTQ film festival in the world, one of the most renowned. Um, and about 10 years ago, they were in a lot of hot water for um, what activists refer to as pinkwashing. So there was a lot of protesting happening outside of that festival um, in the service of Palestine solidarity activism. So in general, film festivals are this just really dynamic place for media activism, for discourse on Palestine, um, for people to kind of converse and argue and talk and um, also emote and enjoy and like have the pleasure of cinema all at once, right? So I, I that's why I'm interested in film festivals because they're really just dynamic and ever changing and anything can happen. Yeah. Um. On that on that note of um, pink washing and um, kind of tying into some of your other research on compulsory Zionism, um, what makes well, first of all, how did compulsory Zionism gain so much traction? Let's start there at a very basic level. Yeah, so when I was doing research in, for my dissertation, I came across this term compulsory Zionism, which was coined by Arela Shadmi, um, who is actually an Israeli scholar. Um, she didn't publish it in an, an academic piece. It was in a um, an article she wrote um, for a newsletter um, in, for an organization in Jerusalem, which is now defunct. But um, I was really interested in thinking about compulsory Zionism as a as how it as a larger structure, right? So compulsory Zionism kind of comes it, it maps onto Adrian Rich's concept of compulsory heterosexuality, right? So Adrian Rich very famously theorized compulsory heterosexuality as um, this larger structure, this larger hegemonic thing that structures our society, which makes, in her mind, lesbianism um, invisible, impossible, improbable, right? Um, And so the way that Rich kind of talks about it is the way that even feminist scholars invisibilize lesbian um, culture was how kind of Rich entered that angle, right? So I was um, interested in thinking about how Zionism functions in much of the same way that um, the kind of insistence that support for the state of Israel um, must be prioritized at all costs um, really renders Palestinians invisible and in, in many ways impossible, right? So um, in the same way that compulsory heterosexuality um, subjugates lesbians, but also gay people, queer people, trans people more generally, um, compulsory Zionism subjugates not only Palestinians, but also Palestine solidarity activism. Now, I think that there has been kind of some interesting things within Palestine solidarity activism in which um, there is kind of a thread of compulsory Zionism operating within Palestine solidarity activism. And by that, I mean that Palestinians like actual Palestinians have been subjugated within Palestine solidarity activism at times. So part of what I wrote about in the the Journal of Palestine Studies article that I that I published on compulsory Zionism was thinking about the way that compulsory Zionism even exists within Palestine solidarity activism as a way to manage who can speak about Palestine and who cannot, right? Um, and who, what kind of solidarity is appropriate for Palestine solidarity activism? Who in solidarity is appropriate, right? Does um, that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure if you, you were stopping or there was like another sentence coming. Um, can you also like help frame it with regards to like pink washing or like how they operate similarly or why they're very interesting to kind of like study um, in a, you know, like, conjunctive manner like compulsory zionism and pinkwashing how they're mm-hmm. related or like, yeah how they're related what's similar how do they operate within the u.s in particular um what makes them particularly i would say either like powerful or um i don't, I don't want to say threatening but like that kind of like powerful and or like intimidating as structures yeah. So one thing that I wrote about in in an article that I published in GLQ was um, 
the way that I think that actually anti-pinkwashing activism predates the kind of 21st century anti-pinkwashing activism scene, if that makes sense. So around like 2000, like let's say 2010 is when um, anti-pinkwashing really started to to take off. And a lot of activists, um, the term pinkwashing came out, people started to understand it as a way that the state of Israel uses LGBTQ subjectivity to promote itself as a liberal democracy, right? Israel Israel is so advanced because it loves the gays. This is kind of the line of thinking. That's how pinkwashing operates. Um, and um, radical leftist queers, mostly in the United States, but as well as in Europe um, and Canada, were basically like not in not in our name. Um, you cannot uphold the state of Israel and its apartheid practices in the name of gay rights. Like that doesn't mm-hmm. sit well with us, right? So that's kind of how mm-hmm. anti pinkwashing came about. Um, but what bothered me, and this is what bothers me all the time in all all realms of my scholarship, is um, mm-hmm. when people don't look at the kind of historical context, right? And so there have been actually a lot more discussions around like LGBT, queer, Palestine solidarity that predate the 21st century, right? So the article in GLQ looks at the early 1990s and a kind of um, moment that you might look at as an anti-pinkwashing moment in the early 1990s around the representation of Ilya Suleiman's work at the Institute of Contemporary Art in in Boston, Massachusetts, alongside... um, Robert Maplethorpe, right? So there was a co- there were two kind of controversies in the early '90s um, attempts to to censor Robert Maplethorpe's work. Robert Maplethorpe was a very famous um, gay artist who had, you know, you, we could consider his work to be problematic in racial ways in many, and I could talk about that um, as well. But um, you know, an attempt by the the radical right in the United States to censor Robert Maplethorpe's work, um, and the the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, said, "No, we will not censor this work. The work, um, you know, is protected under the First Amendment, etc." A year later, um, the ICA essentially censored. Ilya Suleiman's show, um, which was called Uprising, which was an exhibition of Palestinian film and video art, basically saying, mm, this work can't actually stand on its own. It needs to be accompanied by a panel discussion and we need Alan Dershowitz to come in and kind of contextualize things. And Ilya Suleiman was like, mm, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, so it was an interesting moment where the double standard around Palestine and the representation of Palestine and the ability to speak about Palestine was very clear. And um, you know, one of the ways that people kind of came to the f- defense of Palestinian film and video art at that time was saying, um, basically making the comparison, saying, you know, are you going to ask if you're going to have a, an LGBT film festival, are you going to ask for there to be a panel of, um, I believe one person wrote a letter to the editor saying, are you going to ask for a panel of esteemed heterosexuals to defend <laughs> themselves? No, because that that sounds kind of ridiculous, right? So why are you asking right. um, Palestinian filmmakers to have a panel of of Zionists to to give their case, right? So that yeah. was a really early example of anti-pinkwashing. Another example is I have an article in the pipeline coming out in 2024 on um, Palestinian American ac- queer activism in the San Francisco Bay Area starting in 1989. So again, I'm kind of always chipping away back <laughs> into history to look at what what happened before. How did things yeah. emerge before? Because, you know, as much popularity as the anti-pink washing movement got in the 21st century, I think it's really important to remember that people were still doing this work in the late 80s and early 90s, and they did not get any right. credit for it. Then. Right. Um, right. So that's kind of where, where that emerges from. Yeah, um, no, it's fascinating. I think that's something that I've been thinking about is just like how when it becomes like a collective mass and it has a label, then it's suddenly kind of like validated compared to like previous waves of activism that weren't particularly like labeled in a particular way, um, tend to get dismissed or um, not properly contextualized or historicized or documented um, because they don't fit so neatly into like the ways that we categorize um, either activism or movements contemporarily um shifting gears a little bit 
or a lot. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Palestinian film. So I think that's something that I wanted to ask kind of like as a, a broad basis. What would you, um, how would you categorize Palestinian film? And is there anything that distinguishes it stylistically? This is a very, um, I think, hot, not necessarily hot button question, but it is a question that I have grappled with that people are are grappling with um, right now. Um, I don't think that Palestinian cinema has um, a particular, I don't think you can categorize it in a very like strict way. And that ha- that's for a yeah. few reasons, which is that um, are we thinking about Palestinian cinema as a question of authorship? Like, is the filmmaker Palestinian? Are we thinking of Palestinian as a question of financing? Who's funding the film? Are we thinking of Palestinian cinema in the uh, in terms of aesthetics? Um, if you kind of look at those three kind of categories, you could you could have very different sets of what constitutes Palestinian cinema, right? So, um, I think attempts to categorize Palestinian cinema are really difficult and in many ways problematic. Um, and unfortunately, I have seen through you know the research I've conducted both ethnographically and historically attempts to delineate a Palestinian film or a Palestinian filmmaker are really problematic in that there's oftentimes this attempt to delineate who is Palestinian and who is not, right? So a lot of the time it kind of comes down to this question of identity. And I think that that can be really dangerous, especially when we're talking about Palestine, because, um, you know, obviously the Palestinian body politic is a very large community in diaspora and in exile, right? And so um, if you start to kind of quantify who is Palestinian, who is not, who constitutes Palestine, right? Then we get into very sketchy fascist territory, right? Anytime you're trying to count bodies, it's a bad scene, right? Um, now, I also, so I, I feel very ambivalent about c- categorizing Palestinian cinema in terms of identity. But at the same time, I want to recognize that there are films that have been referred to as Palestinian films that have been made by people who are in no way, shape or form identify as Palestinian. Right. So a really famous example would be David Koff was a documentary filmmaker. He made a film called Occupied Palestine. He's Jewish American. May he rest in peace. He he passed away several years ago. Um, his film was talked about in the press, in the news controversy around his film as a Palestinian film. So you can see how this is problematic, right? There are Palestinian filmmakers, Palestinian people who are in exile and diaspora who are making films who are not considered Palestinian filmmakers. And then there's like a larger history of films made by non-Palestinian identifying people, which are then referred to as Palestinian films, right? So it's a very messy, tangled ball of yarn. Um, And I don't really have a clear answer for you, but I ask that when people are talking about Palestinian cinema, that they are careful about these kinds of things and, and, and do a little bit of research to understand the financing, the identities of the author's whether they're producers, directors, et cetera, um, the content of the film, et cetera, right? So okay. I don't know if that helps to answer your question. <laughs> no, I think it just adds context because I think sometimes when these questions um, arise, I think people really want clear-cut answers. But um, when you're talking about identity or when you're talking about like a community that, as you said, lives in exile, it's hard to um, be so explicit without you know being a little blindsided by like the full context of the situation yeah and so like the example you have on the screen is shane <laughs> davis's film may in the summer which was the opening film mm-hmm. for the boston Palestine film festival i believe it was in the ninth year of the festival mm-hmm. and this is again why i'm interested in looking at reception because the audience had a very mixed reception to this film and um uh, I wrote about this in an article that is in a, an edited volume um, called Sajilu. Um, but anyway, the, the audience had a mixed reception to this. And some people said outright on you know Facebook or in interviews with me, I don't think this is a Palestinian film. 
this was not a Palestinian mm-hmm. film. It's not set in Palestine, et cetera, right? So it got me wondering, like, what is a Palestinian film? Why why are you rejecting Shireen Dubbis as a Palestinian filmmaker in this moment? Like, it's a great film. It's quirky. It's funny. Um, it's heartwarming. It's sad at times. Um, and yeah, it's not set in Palestine, but they are diasporic Palestinian characters. Um at one point, there's a scene where they're at the Dead Sea and you can see Palestine in the background, right? Um, so it really, you know, I, I was really troubled by the rejection of this film. Um, and, and so I kind of, that's kind of where that, that chapter kind of originated, was thinking about the way Palestinian cinema is received by Palestinian American or pal- diasporic Palestinian audiences and how warm films yeah. are received, celebrated, and some are rejected, right? And now, of course... Shireen Dubbis has been nominated for an Emmy and people are very happy to embrace her as a Palestinian filmmaker. But at the time, that wasn't necessarily the case. And so, you know, I feel a little bit righteous about this. Like, well, if you love her now, you had to love her then too. But of course, people people are allowed to change their minds. But um, I just thought it was very interesting, right? The rejection right. of her initially and now the full embrace of her now that she has been nominated for an Emmy. So, um, um it- it's this cult- question of cultural capital, right? Um, I was about to say, and I wanted to kind of like get into that a little bit. Um, what do you think defines or motivates this kind of like sense of rejection of certain artists within their communities that they tend to practice in? Like, I think that's something that I've talked to a few artists about and they struggle with it, which is like, why am I working in my community and trying to highlight it or trying to tell a really honest story about us? But mm-hmm. the minute I touch on a subject that's a little less mainstream, people suddenly hate my work um, and it becomes very personal. Um, yeah. How do you make sense of that in the frameworks that you operate in or your scholarship? Yeah, I mean, this is certainly not unique to Palestinian cinema or Palestinian art or even much largely, much more largely Arab American art or Arab art. Um But when we're talking about Palestine, it has larger consequences, right? So um, I am of the mind that anyone who is attempting to um, embrace or reject or uh, create boundaries around who is a Palestinian artist and who is welcome within kind of the Palestinian art world or who is considered a Palestinian filmmaker um, is it's part of this process of trying to count and quantify Palestinians, right? And anytime there is a rejection of someone as Palestinian, that is doing the work of compulsory Zionism, right? Anytime you're saying, oh, this, this film doesn't count as a Palestinian film because X, Y, and Z. Um, that is doing the work of compulsory Zionism, right? Um, sorry, that's my dog having a little shake. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, so I, that's kind of how I, my thinking evolved around thinking about categorization of Palestinian cinema, but also how compulsory Zionism works, sometimes in insidious ways from within community, mm-hmm. right? And I'm not saying that, um, you know, I think that the compulsory Zionism is internalized and that's, an, that's a consequence of colonialism, right? Is the yeah. way that the anxiety around, and the feeling of scarcity around, especially Palestine and the material Palestine, um, Jasper's having a drink. <laughs> the way that, uh, you know, Palestinians are so subjugated and so deprived of basic things like material existence and human rights <laughs> creates the sense of scarcity. And so there's an attempt to be like, well, no, I'm really Palestinian, so I deserve X and, and other people kind of get shut out, right? So that the the internalized compulsory Zionism I feel originates from a sense of scarcity and anxiety. Right. Um, that is a condition of apartheid, right? It's it's part right. of the condition of apartheid and colonialism. Um, no, but that self-monitoring that kind of becomes part of like um most a lot of people's psychological processes, right? Like, can I say this or can I not? Will I lose my job? Will I not? Will I um uh, I don't know, misrepresent you know, the culture that I have, or it's just, it's interesting how it operates in these like very insidious psychological ways um, when these structures can get so um, ubiquitous in, in culture and cultural thinking. Um, 
Yeah. And, you know, Nadine Neighbor wrote an incredible book called The Arab America. Um, and in that book, she talks about this idea of the politics of cultural authenticity. And she talks about how um, the way that er- the ways that are considered ideal representations of Arabness or, or performances of Arabness are heavily influenced by the policing of gender and sexual norms. Right. So to me, it's not at all surprising that Shireen Dabas' film May in the Summer was rejected by the audience, considered a not a Palestinian film, because A, it's about it's a film about women. B, um, Dabas herself got her career started by uh, writing for shows like The L Word, right? Um, and so gender and sexuality are um, categories that kind of get ticked and be like, oh, well, this is not part of Palestinian culture or this is not part of larger Arab yeah. culture, right? Um, because it is considered kind of a taboo subject, right? So gender and sexuality yeah. become this this way to police the borders of Palestinian identity in particular, um, which I find very problematic. I myself have experienced um, rejection from larger family, from community organizations. Um, I've been uninvited from giving, I've been invited to give keynote addresses and uninvited um, because people have asked, oh, you know, please don't talk about queerness, right? As in, I'm not going to not talk about queerness. I am a queer person, right? Um, so the the policing of the borders of Palestinianness are very much that policing is is taking place taking place within the realm of gender and sexuality. So, um, yeah, I think that it's really this is it's starting to change now, but it's still very much present, yeah. right? And and I yeah. think that. I'm grateful for filmmakers like Shireen Dubbis who have, um, you know, centralized the stories of diasporic women in particular. And um, there have been audience members who I have interviewed who have also been very grateful for those representations. And um, yeah, I think that we're definitely going to see much more of that, especially as, you know, younger people start to make films and and there's more access to filmmaking at, at this point now. Yeah. Um. It is interesting where that sexuality is kind of like the grounds by which policing happens. Because I know that um, one sociological article that I really like is um, by Espiritu, where she has an article on um, we don't sweep around like white girls do. And the policing of like woman's sexuality is kind of like the place by which identity or nationhood or um, culture is kind of like uh, imbued. Um, so it's always so interesting, like, wh- why gender tends to have that kind of, like, um, very, like, I kept that, the word that I can think of for some reason is swollen, but very swollen, kind of. Uh, I mean, that, it, uh, that works. I mean, it makes sense because, um, you know, how is nationalism reproduced? I mean, mm-hmm. in part by the reproduction of bodies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you have to control those bodies. And so anything that threatens the actual reproduction of bodies is considered a threat to the nation, right? So right. Um, this is why I'm kind of, uh, I'm not into nationalism because I think that it ha- right. it's ha- way too close of a relationship to, unfortunately, fascism, which is very much invested in controlling bodies and and who reproduces and who doesn't. So um yeah, I mean it, it's unfortunate, but it, it, it's true, and 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 I think that yeah. I think that there is now starting to be a larger conversation about, um, you know, how to not reproduce. Uh, problematic. I'm using the word reproduce to talk about reproduction, but I think that there's <laughs> there's more, more willingness now to talk about diaspora, especially in terms of Palestine, like. Um, the value and the the um, validity of diaspora and exile, people in diaspora and exile. Whereas um, I think in, in other periods, it's been more difficult. But I think now we're kind of, we're seeing more more openness to, and of the of the validity and acceptance of diasporic position, positionality. Yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, these four periods of Palestinian cinema that are highlighted um, in this book that I know that you kind of referenced quite a bit. So I wanted to ask like how you think through the framework of this book and um, how do you contextualize it 
um, both for your students, but also for yourself as a scholar and the way that like you, it might undergird some of your analysis. Yeah. So this book is kind of like one of the most important books, I would say, in the study of Palestinian cinema, um, because it really charts out um, the how and and who was making films in Palestine at, at what different periods alongside, you know, the the rise of cinema as a technology, of filmmaking as a technology, and um, the geopolitics of Palestine and the history of Palestine. So um, the third and fourth are kind of like the more bread and butter important parts of understanding the periodization of Palestinian cinema. Um, and so I'll kind of kind of just focus there. But, you know, the second period essentially was thinking about um, the use of, you know, the United Nations um, or kind of other aid agencies or international newsreels kind of reporting on Palestine to a larger audience. The third period, though, is really what, what we might consider like Palestinian self-representation within the realm of Palestinian cinema, right? Um, so uh, the Palestine Film Unit was an actual unit that was part of, considered part of the revolutionary movement. Um, it was designed to essentially make propaganda films um, to advance the, the, the Palestinian cause. And those films were conceived of as basically a form of third cinema. They were designed for um, people who were involved in third, other third world struggles, right? And they were um, heavily influenced by Marxist-Leninism. And um, they, were, they were conceived of as revolutionary films films about the revolution, um, and they were geared for audiences that were invested in third world liberation. Um, and that's kind of the bulk of where Palestinian cinema as self-representative cinema emerges. Um, and, you know, a lot of those films got lost and disappeared. Some of them have been recovered and found in, in other places, like, for example, more recently in Tokyo, um, there was a cache of films that were found. Um, but the fourth period begins in 1980, and that's when we see the rise of um, what I like to call the art house Palestinian film, right? So not documentary, but um, narrative film um, or and, and even experimental kind of artsy film, right? So you might consider the beginning of the fourth period to be um, Michel Khalifa's Fertile Memory, which is actually... Um, you know, it's a little bit documentary, a little bit not. <laughs> um, but really the beginning of the fourth period is Michel Khalifa's Wedding in Galilee, which is very clearly a narrative film. It subscribes to kind of a more traditional narrative film structure. And it's kind of the first film that got a lot of international attention as like a creative um, narrative film from Palestine. Um, so 1980 is where we start to see the fourth period and the fourth period extends into the contemporary moment um, as we have seen kind of the evolution of Palestinian cinema as it circulates um, through mainly film festivals like A-level film festivals like the Cannes Film Festival or Venice um, or, you know, festivals in the United States. Um, does that make sense that the fourth that, period is yeah. really where narrative cinema kind of... yeah. Not, That's really interesting. Yeah. Why, why do you think that narrative came through in after the eighties as opposed to before? Like, what what made it? Like, what mm -hmm. kind of constituted the shift from documentary to narrative? You know, I think that um, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, in the third period, the goal was to create documentary and informational films that were going to just convey information about Palestine. And that's not to say that those films did not have creative elements. They certainly did. But the fourth period is when you have a, a hardcore investment in narrative film and thinking about narrative film at for a larger audience outside of Palestine, for a Western audience, indeed. Um, and so the fourth period shift towards narrative, I think, is twofold. One, to be able to communicate with a Western audience, to communicate and represent Palestine to a Western audience. But also, I think that filmmakers, artists, 
And this is true for for many groups, and it's not just about Palestine, but for Palestine in particular, there's a huge burden of representation to constantly represent the struggle, to represent the conflict, in air quotes, obviously. Um, And sometimes artists just want to make art, right? Sometimes filmmakers just want to make something. Um, But there's this heavy expectation, oh, you must make a film. If you're Palestinian, you must make a film that is about the struggle, that is about the con- the material conditions in Palestine. And, you know, the early works from the fourth period, like Michel Khalifa, certainly does that through narrative cinema. But it also talks about many other topics, some of which are taboo, like gender and sexuality, or well, not necessarily taboo, but um, what we were just talking about, about in terms of the policing of, of, of Palestinianness, right? You know, Films in the more contemporary moment that have leaned more heavily into experimental or narrative um, that don't address the conflict, quote unquote. Um, you know, Jamana Mana is uh, a Scandinavian Palestinian filmmaker, and her work doesn't always address, you know, politics with a capital P. And she is because she's starting to be recognized as a really important diasporic Palestinian filmmaker. So I think we have come a long way from the third period and and Palestinian artists and filmmakers are, they now have the liberty to make films either about the struggle or the conflict or not and make films about something completely different, right? I think to reduce Palestinian filmmaking to only about the so-called struggle or so-called conflict is really problematic and it's part it's often used as a way to police identity again. Well, this film is not really about Palestine. You're not really a Palestinian filmmaker because your film doesn't address the conflict, right? Um, You know, I think a lot of films in the contemporary moment still do, obviously. You cannot necessarily ignore what's going on, but there is a willingness and an ability to have much more, a much larger form of creative expression and a much larger um, way to kind of, a larger bag of which to kind of draw from, you know, to to be able to make films that are not just about, you know, politics with a capital P. Yeah. Um, kind of on that note, and before we shift to the quick Q&A, um, a great case study of this is Baha, which I know you've written about, Um and I know you have this article in which you write, like, engaging in a film from a purely representative point can undercut, like, the conversation that we can have about it from an artistic perspective or a stylistic perspective. Um, and I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on, like, what do we lose socially, culturally, um, even from the sense of, like, activist-oriented power um, by purely engaging with films from a representative perspective? I mean, I think, so one concern that I had with the way that Farha was being received in the U.S. was that um, it was Jordan's official submission for the Oscars. And so my concern around that was that Jordan stood to gain tremendously through the representation of Palestinian trauma. And as a state, Jordan has not, does not have the greatest track record for the treatment of Palestinian refugees. So from the go, I found that very problematic. In terms of Farha itself as a representation, you know, I bristle at any kind of um, attempt to delineate something as a first. Um, People were really excited about this film as the first representation of the Nakba. And um, while I understand where they were coming from, there have been representations of the Nakba in Palestinian cinema before Farha, right? So a very clear example is Ilya Suleiman's The Time That Remains, Um, and granted, Suleiman represented the Nakba in his very classic, um, absurdist aesthetic, um, very different kind of representation. Um, so I, I just, I bristle at any kind of attempt to be like, this is the first of anything. Um, but what I found difficult about Farha was that I don't think it left a lot of room for, um, you know, an an exploration of what happened in the Nakba. I felt that it it was really um, 
didactic in many ways. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about this filmmaker. I just want to premise this by saying I'm really excited about this filmmaker. I think um, she's got huge support behind her and she's got a long way to go. And I think she's going to going to make some incredible films. But my struggle with this film was that I just I felt that it was it was too didactic. And I, I wanted there to be something more from this film. And this is a struggle I have had with the way that as Palestinian film, films become more popular in the United States and become more accessible in the United States, we are seeing kind of a condensing of what kinds of representations um, take place in Palestinian cinema, right? right? So if you look at the early fourth period films, there's and even the middle range fourth period films, there's lots of different kinds of stories, lots of different kinds of representation. And in the more contemporary films that are coming out in the more contemporary moment, we're seeing just kind of like the repetition of tropes um, okay. over and over and over again. And some people have written about that in terms of, well, that's an indication of, you know, the repetition of these tropes and symbols is an indication of traumatic memory. Um, and that's not necessarily wrong. I, I do agree with that. But I think that this is, again, relates to the origins of the fourth period is that Palestinian filmmakers wanted to be able to make films that were diverse and that had lots of different perspectives and lots of different kind of angles and aesthetics um, and not necessarily just be tied to, you know, the domain of, quote unquote, the conflict. Um, is Farha an important film? Absolutely. Do I support the film? Absolutely. One thing that I really struggled with was that the film became an object. Um, and it, um, it was the way that people talked about it in terms of activist terms was just screen the film, don't watch it, just have it play in the background, just watch it so the numbers get up, the data in Netflix's little data brain get ticked up and go like upvoted on, in, on IMDb. And I thought that did a huge disservice to the film itself, right? If you're going to support a film, you should probably watch the film. You shouldn't just kind of amplify its numbers, right? So I think that that does a disservice to the filmmaker who put a lot of effort into creating a narrative and making um, a piece of art and to just reduce it to an object that can be leveraged in the mm. service of activism mm. is problematic. And thus, I say this as someone who studies media activism. Like, I right. understand the way that media is used for activist purposes, but to deny the film the ability to stand on its own as a piece of art and as a piece of cinema is really problematic, right? Like I understand that people wanted to up the numbers on Netflix and wanted to, to leverage the data of screening um, by having people just screen the film in the background. And I understand why people were reluctant to watch it because it is a traumatic film and, and people were going to be triggered. Um, but I just think that people owed the filmmaker, I think that they owed Salam a lot more than to just use it like that, right? I think that it should have been engaged with as a film and talked about as a film and people could have talked about it as a piece of art, right? Um, I'm going to shift this to the quick Q&A. Um, okay. These are some quick, fun questions. So what are you reading or watching right now? Um, Honestly, right now, nothing because I just finished the semester and I gave myself May to just do nothing. But um, I did just finish reading Mejdaline Shomali's book, Between Bennett, um, Queer Arab oh, Critique yeah. and Transnational Arab Archives, which is an incredible book. And my students also read it. Um, I am also starting to read uh, Psychoanalysis Under Occupation by Lara Shiha and Istvan Shiha. And I will be assigning that next semester in my classes. Um, in terms of watching, I'm watching The Circle, which is reality television. And that's just what I need after teaching a very intense semester of Palestinian cinema. So getting my, okay. my reality TV fix. <laughs> Who would you look to shadow for a day, past or present? Um, this might sound kind of weird, but um, Monty Don, who is the host of Gardener's World, a public television show um about gardening uh, uh gardener's world and monty don got me through the hardest moments of pandemic lockdown and i am a, an avid gardener and i just would like to follow him around his estate um 
and learn about horticulture and gardening and hang out with his two golden retrievers. Yeah. Sounds like a good thing. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, I think that there are two kind of big misconceptions about my work. One is that um, people are often surprised to learn that it focuses mostly on the United States. Um, I really look at the exhibition and circulation and reception of Palestinian cinema and Palestinian cinema focused media activism in the context of the United States. So people are often like very bristly about that. They're like, why aren't you doing research in Palestine? And I'm like, well, I'm trained in American studies and this is my project. So that's one thing. The other thing is that um, I think people see that when I look, when I use, they see in my work when I use queer theory, um, they automatically assume that I'm talking about gender and sexuality. And sometimes I am, but that's not necessarily the focus. I use queer theory as an analytical lens. I'm not studying Palestinian gender and sexuality, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there's an assumption that I'm talking about Palestinian queerness as gender and sexuality when I'm really talking about um, power relations and looking at queer theory as a way to understand power relations in the context of the United States and Palestine Solidarity Act. Whose work do you admire and are inspired by? Um, I really love artists. Well, first of all, I'm a huge fan of um, printmaking and illustration. And I really love artists who um, lean into representations of like queer joy and queer abundance and queer pleasure. Um, so uh, Jeffrey Chung is an artist that I really love. His drawings are just beautiful and bonacious is kind of a way that I would describe his work. Um, I'm also a really huge fan of Christina Atik, who is an illustrator, an Arab American illustrator, um, who uh, does lean into looking at like pleasure and joy and abundance of Arab women and Arab women's experiences, but also throws back the double standard, um, patriarchal double standards and misogynistic double standards through her work. So her series, um, it's not nice for a girl. I love that series. I think it's incredible. And I learned about Christina Teague's work um, through actually through reading Mejdalene Shomali's book, Between Bennett. So I just wanted to... Um, you know, say as an example of kind of the lineage of where, you know, this, the knowledge of these things comes from. It's really important to me. Um, mm -hmm. So Christina Atik, Jeffrey Chung, in terms of filmmakers, I really love Maisalun Hamoud. She made the film between, uh, excuse me, the uh, in between is the film that she made. And again, it's a really beautiful and tragic film and really difficult film, but it also is a film that celebrates Palestinian women and Palestinian women's mm -hmm. love and resilience and solidarity with one another. And I think that's, it's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on our podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, this was great. <laughs>